from Playho. Oh my god, even for all. Like, he totally knows where I live. <laughs> Can't even with this guy. Argument about guns, and you've made it many, many times. I'm not convinced, but nonetheless, that's, uh, that's an opinion. Brazil, the bigger problem there, who has the guns? It's not the criminals. It's the death squads that mm -hmm. essentially go into these areas under the pretense of gunning down, stopping crime, and essentially going after the drug lords and the gangs and all of that, and murdering, wantonly, murdering many people. Almost all of them, Keith, look like you. Uh, almost all of them look like, well, not me, because, you know, my Polynesian ancestors, we don't know about this <laughs> racial thing, but they look like you. Um, basically, the poorest of the poor, almost all black, that they are being murdered. And that's been that way for a while in Brazil with the death squads. The police, the paramilitaries, they have the guns and they do whatever they want. They don't even make a pretense there that they're going to try any of them. At least here, every once in a while, one a police officer, they like Chauvin, they'll pop him here every once in a while. But down there, they have a license to kill, and boy, do they use it. So I got your argument about guns. The problem is guns in whose hands in Brazil? Um, you got a murderous police force. You got a murderous uh, paramilitary operation there. And the guns are aimed at people, the poorest of the poor, people of color. What well, your thought about that, Keith? Is that is that fair? Even with the gun argument? Well, my thought is the same. I said if the people are armed, there'd be less chance of them just being run over by anybody. Well, uh, the facts don't belie that, though, in Brazil. Uh, they have the police, they have the highest police murder rate, murdering civilians of any other country on the planet. So I don't know, we have to be careful. There has to be a balance here somewhere. All right, Keith, any other thought? Got to move on. Well, just that, uh, the, the people that are armed uh, and, and trained, they will be able to defend themselves. And that's what I'm all about, the right to self-defense. All right. Oh. All right, well, Keith, I don't, Keith, I can tell you one thing. I don't think you'll ever have to worry about that right being a bridge in the United States. First of all, it's in the Constitution. You got the Second Amendment, even though that's been distorted. Uh, you got the SCOTUS recently that essentially said anybody and everybody can just about carry a gun. So, Keith, I, I, don't, I don't think your argument is going <laughs> to go anywhere on that one. By, by that, I mean, I don't think you're going to lose that argument you got state power behind you and a constitution. All right, Keith, always a pleasure talking with you. Let me move on. All right, y'all, let's see if we can get uh, Jenna from Vallejo. Jenna, go right ahead, line seven. Jenna? Hey, Earl, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Okay, Earl, I miss you, dude. That was so good having breakfast with you. Ah. <laughs> we'll always, well, and by the way, Jenna, let me just say this. You're always welcome whenever you're in town. You can roll through. We're at the Dunbar Restaurant. Actually, a hotel. Let me give them the, Jenna, let me give them the address first. A lot of people don't know. Dunbar Hotel, 4229 South Central. We are there every Sunday at 9 a.m. And Jenna, you know, it's a free for all. People come, have the best breakfast in town. That's right, y'all. You heard me, the best breakfast in town. And in addition to that, topics whatever you want to talk about whatever's there whatever you feel moved about it's like an open forum on sunday so jenna you you came on one time at some point in the future we'll see you back again but anyway jenna your thought this morning yeah i mean it's, it's far for me so the, it's like hard for me to get up there but like i totally enjoyed that so pa pocketbell i thought that was like brandenburg concerto or like four seasons or something so it's pocketbell oh the Brandenburg? I thought it was Brandenburg, but you know what? I, I look, I'm, I'm like so out of, uh, like I'm so far removed from my... Oh, you, you mean the uh, theme music that I'm using this morning? Yes, exactly. Okay, no, no, no. Let's see, uh, the Paco Bell Cannon. Jean-Francois Payard. Oh, Paco Bell Cannon. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Well, all right. So, so um, to your point about uh, racism, um, especially in, in regards to the police and stuff, what I've noticed, you know, and because, you know, like being a, a Karen, if you will, um, we see it too. It's not like we don't see it. You know, we see it too. And um, I've noticed it more in L.A. than I have actually in Orange County, which is kind of surprising, right? Yeah, we got to call Because you would think that Orange County would be worse. But L.A. seems 
to be worse because y'all live in villages. You're living in, like, villages, right? Mm. And so you're segregating yourself. And um, there are certain neighborhoods that were, they were formerly more integrated. Like, Echo Park used to be more integrated in the 80s when I was a kid. Um, and there are areas that are getting gentrified that um, it's, it's, it's complicating the situation. Mm-hmm. And, um, but yes, I, I think that absolutely the police are more likely to take the life of a person of color than a white person. They'll, they, they will try and figure out how to take down a white person safely. Well, I, you know what, Jenna, let me do this. Let me take a couple of minutes. I want to talk. I want to comment on that. I have a thought about that. Anyway, Jenna, we're at the Dunbar every Sunday whenever you're in town. Come on by. You know, you're always welcome. Thanks again, Jenna. We appreciate I love, that. I love having eggs with you. I love having eggs with you. Guess what? We're going to do it again. All right, Jenna, thanks again. All right, Jenna's point. Let's speak to that. It comes up, y'all, yeah, over and over again. Why a young Hispanic? or a young African-American, almost always a male, why, in many cases, they're unarmed, they are unarmed, or there might even be, we'll concede that, there may be a situation where they may have had some blunt, not a gun, you know, a knife or something, but generally unarmed. Why they come up dead, why they're in a pine box, why they're riddled like a Jalen Walker, and why you have white mass murderers that walk away that walk away, some, as we know, almost shamefully and disgracefully, uh, taken out by police (laughs) after they're arrested gently, taken to a hamburger stand, uh, or how they're treated, the kid glove treatment. It strikes to several things about policing. I brought up Western Europe with uh, with a guy I've been debating on, you know, Facebook, who's trying to tell me, you know, they have less crime in Europe, they have this, uh, they don't have the violence, they don't have the threat, the police officers are not under the gun, blah, blah, blah. No, no that's not going to fly. The fact of the matter is when you have an unarmed subject, suspect that has surrendered, that is complying, and that person is still shot. That person is still either wounded, but more likely killed. You're talking about a worldview, a mindset about policing. Number one, uh, they have the right under the law. If they feel it's a judgment call, subjective, if they feel there's any danger or threat, we have the right to use up to and including uh, ex- deadly force, whatever it takes to protect the officer. That's number one. Now, there have been some limitations on that, but not enough. And the fact of the matter is, it's a subjective call. Secondly, layered over with race and racism, all of the biases, the bigotry, the stereotypes, all of that about young blacks and Hispanic males, right away, you have the fear factor. Automatically, there's a feeling, my life is in danger, even when it's not. The third thing, they understand that they are the gendarmes of the state. They have official state power, quasi-state power, to take life or not take life. Life and death judgment over an individual. So they know they'll be protected. They know that they will, in fact, if in the rare cases a charge is brought against them just for an outrageous shooting, then they also know they have the best attorneys. Uh, The Police Protective League will be there. They will be backed up 100%. Um, They'll have a lightweight prosecution, if that. They'll have a lightweight judge leaning toward them and a jury that in many cases will not convict. They get in a little bit better with juries now, but not much. So they know that basically all those things are in place. They also know something else. They've got public opinion on this side. Generally speaking, we see that now with um, L.A. County District Attorney George Gascon. Gascon's on the fire now because he came in and he tried to do the right thing, i.e., bring justice and fairness to prosecuting in the district attorney's office. He may have made a couple of mistakes there, going a little too fast, but the point is his heart was in the right legal place. As you can see right now, he may be recalled. Why? Because soft on crime... By the seen that way by the majority, and of course the whole police and legal establishment, prosecutorial establishment, including those in his office. So you've got all of these factors weighing.
But the bottom line is race and racism. You are seen differently. Again, going back to what my uncle decades ago said, in a very prescient, like that word, in a very prescient moment, their idea of law enforcement is harassing some 15-year-old black kid. Now, he was using hyperbole. He was using somewhat exaggeration to make a point. But he wasn't too far off. He was not too far off. Go ask Shaylin Walker. All right, let's do this. Let's see if we can get uh, Harold's been waiting a long time, Redland. Harold, line eight. Harold, go right ahead.